It had been 10 years since Michael Myers first made the scene. The Halloween filmmakers wanted to bring him back in a big way. Halloween 4 really was the rebirth of the franchise. Do you know what today is? Do you know the date? But can audiences once again bear to look at Michael Myers with the mask on? LA played rivals on screen. Did that kind of carry off screen or were you? But you don't see that little bitch here today, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Uncle? Oh, these people don't know Halloween. I am pregnant with, with my uncle's baby. Like, I just didn't understand what had shifted. Hello, my dear children of the darkness. I hope you've been having an amazing Halloween so far. Happy Samhain. So the Thorn timeline, what the hell is that? If you've ever found yourself asking that question about the Halloween franchise, then look no further. I'm gonna break it all down for you today. I'll start with a quick catch up on the prior installments leading up to this trilogy. Then we'll kick off the deep dive with Halloween 4 and I'll have all my usual segments on scripting, casting, onset stories, release and reception. We'll rinse and repeat for Halloween 5 and 6 as well. However, there are some special topics Topics that come along with each movie. For example, what's up with the goofy mask in Halloween 4? What the hell was up with replacing Danielle Harris in part 6? We also have to get into the alternate cuts of Halloween 6. There's a lot to get into today. This is going to be one of my longest deep dives to date, so I hope you're strapped in for this Halloween special. If that all sounds good to you, I hope you have a big bowl of popcorn. I hope you have a drink to kick back with. But before I dive in, do click that subscribe button. If you're stoked for this, I promise I have other great content on this channel, so also click the like button and the notification notification bell, that way you never miss the next video. Okay, let's get started for real. If you're from my generation, maybe you're only familiar with the David Gordon Green trilogy, but back in the 80s and 90s, the Thorn trilogy did it first. I've explained the whole Halloween timeline, maybe you've seen me over on TikTok. I'm just gonna give you a really quick rundown here to get you up to speed before I dive in. We all know John Carpenter's Halloween, no explanation needed there. If it is needed, I have extensively covered that movie on this channel in the past. There is a ginormous Halloween playlist. Same with the original sequel in 1980. I have a fairly extensive deep dive on that in a form of a comparison to Halloween Kills. That initial sequel introduced us to the concept of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode as siblings, which is carried on throughout this trilogy. Halloween 3 is disconnected from both 2 and 4. I just released an entire deep dive on that movie alone, so maybe watch that one first to catch up if you really want to. But because of the flopification of that movie, they decided to scrap the anthology idea and go back to Michael Myers with part 4. So Halloween 4 the return of Michael Myers is where we begin. I'm gonna start with director Dwight H. Little. I like to give spotlights to the lesser known names of the franchise because credit is due. I also may have to correct some information that I shared in my Halloween 3 deep dive because I found some conflicting information upon my research of Halloween 4. In that deep dive, I said that the failure of Halloween 3 is what caused John Carpenter and Deborah Hill to walk from the franchise, as was stated by Alan Howarth in the making of Halloween 3. But in the Myers fan interview with Dwight H. Little, a mysterious script is brought up that I had not heard of before. I heard that John Carpenter wanted to do something like where Michael Myers was a ghost or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know. I just didn't see how that would work. Yeah, I'm not entirely clear. The, the treatment that he showed, or the script that he showed me that was written by other writers was unsuccessful. So guess who would love to see that script? Me. Another major player of the Halloween franchise is Mustafa Akkad. At this time, he had sole rights to the Halloween franchise franchise, and so he was trying to wake it back up with Michael. However, Little confirmed that he couldn't come to an agreement on the concept with Deborah and John, so he was shopping around for a new director. This was also confirmed in the making of Halloween 4. There was an earlier treatment that uh, I believe John and, and Deborah were working on. There was some discussion and there was sort of an impasse on how to move forward with it. It was also confirmed in the Halloween 25 Years of Terror DVD extras. A man named Dennis Etchison was hired by John to pen the script and Deborah was set to produce, but a cod rejected that script, calling it too cerebral. I think this is what officially caused Deborah and John to walk from the franchise, and also at this time, they sold all their rights to the title of Halloween. Little heard about the new director hunt, and he instructed his agent to chase this job for him. This got him a face-to-face -face interview with Mustafa, where he was able to pitch his idea to bring Michael back as a flesh and blood killer. I mean, that was originally a COD's idea. He wanted to bring Michael back in that fashion. He's a real softie for Michael. He's very protective of the character. He decided that Little was the man for the job, 
job, but then there was a huge rush to get the script written. Little had a friend from school that he knew to be an excellent genre writer named Alan B. McElroy, who also happened to be a very big Halloween fan. Halloween 2 had been one of the, the great experiences for me when I was in college, going to see that with friends. So the chance to bring the shape back to life was a dream come true for me. But there are cons to every job. He was hired on February 25th of 1988, but a writer's strike was coming up on March 7th, meaning he had 11 days to complete a feature length script. According to the director's commentary, a lot of the early conversations revolved solely around how are we going to produce a quality script in just seven to eight months? That was all the time they had from script to screen because the movie would be coming out that very same year. Luckily with McElroy on the team, he grew up in the Midwest, so he had that in his tool belt to get the script written quickly. He got it done and, in my opinion, is a vertebrae in the backbone of this movie's success. Him and someone I've yet to really talk about, Alan Howarth. It's time for another little spotlight here for the man who composed the music for Halloween 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. He's credited alongside Carpenter for 2 and 3, but he has the leading credit for the entire Thorn trilogy. He's a really interesting character. I recommend looking into his life, but here are some quick fun facts. He got started with music when he found found an accordion in his attic and his tinkering with it is what led to his mom getting him accordion lessons. Unfortunately, his music teacher then made a pass at his mom, which meant the end of those lessons. Luckily, he rediscovered music through the saxophone in third grade. Before his composing days, he was in a rock band. He even opened for The Who and other large groups. When he got into composing, he worked on a Star Trek film and a colleague from that movie introduced him to John Carpenter. They met up, he played some tunes live for Carpenter and that was it. Carpenter was so busy with the thing he was up in Vancouver, he was up shooting in Alaska, so at that time he passed off Halloween 2 to Hoarth. Throughout his work on the franchise, he would use the original tracks made by John Carpenter, and then he would add his own layers of synthesizers on top of them. When it came time for Halloween 4, they only invited Alan Hoarth back to compose. Feeling weird about that, he rang up John just to make sure that it was okay, that he accept the job, and John was very blasé about it, like, he was like, go for it. Well, which, which was your favorite Halloween film to work on? Well, for me, I was exciting at Halloween 4 to restart and sort of grab the helm and, and go in my own direction. Big shout out to Howarth. Thank you for giving us the music in this trilogy. Let's now transition into casting. Halloween 4 gave us one of the most iconic actors from this entire franchise, Danielle Harris. They'd been trying to cast little girls in LA, but it simply wasn't working out. Among the girls they auditioned there was Melissa Joan Hart, and you probably are aware of her show, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Guess she just didn't quite have the chops at that time. So they moved casting to New York, which is where Danielle Harris was born and raised. When she came into the room, I knew that was our girl. It was, it's a very odd thing that happened. She was very mature. She was a little older than the character. And all the other girls, you know, they had done commercials or, you know, maybe theater, and they were just kind of still commercially and, and not very realistic and believable. And Daniel Harris was so poised and so mature and so um, confident. I actually knew that she was our girl before she even read the script. Even though they already knew that she was the one, she did have to do some hefty crying and screaming during her audition. Because she was so confident and poised and capable, she was treated like a little adult for the duration of her involvement in this trilogy. Except for that her prep involved only watching the first film, she didn't see the other sequels until later. Another exception was that they had her stay in her trailer while they shot the more violent scenes, not wanting to expose her to that. Although according to her, that stuff didn't really bother her. Of course, Donald Pleasant also returned for this film, and according to Little, that was his biggest incentive to direct. No audition process there, of course, but there was for our other leading lady, Ellie Cornell. According to some sources, Rebecca Schaefer was originally cast in the role, but she had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. According to Cornell, she read for it a few times, she had a screen test on a Friday, and by that Monday, she had the role. In terms of the man, the myth, the legend, Michael Myers, he was set to be played by Tom Morga, but there was a little bit of drama there. Once the movie got rolling, they were having problems. Mustafa was was very protective and picky about the character, like I said, and he just was not happy with what he was seeing in the dailies. Unfortunately, Tom got caught up in some on-set drama that also involved the makeup technician, Ken Horn. We had a problem with the mask, with the eyes being cut open. Uh, the producer came up and wanted the eyes bigger, and I said, there's no way I can cut these eyes open and change the, the filter within three minutes when we're filming, because if we do, the glue would be fresh, and Tom underneath it would actually faint and fall over and kill himself. So we had a big argument. The stuntman had an argument with the producer and finally we kind of won because we had no time to do the change. He decided to fire me. 
and he did. He fired me uh, right in front of the crew. At the time, Pangora Magazine was doing a big article. The guy who was there knew me, and he told the producer that if he didn't hire me back, he would not do anything for him whatsoever to promote this movie. So they turned around within a half an hour and they actually hired me back. So I stayed with the company. Uh, unfortunately, the stuntman did get let go. Morgan got to play Michael in the gas station scene in the drugstore. He drove the truck at Loomis. He was shot out with CO2 and he did the infamous shotgun kill. He was replaced with George P. Wilbur because Mustafa liked his walk. A lot of people are a big fan of the Michael performance in this movie and I used to solely credit George P. Wilbur, but now that I know Morga did basically half the scenes, he performed my favorite kill. I might have to retract that. On the topic of Michael, I have another dedicated section just to the mask. The infamous goofy looking Halloween 4 mask. Let's get into that story. Little's idea for the mask evolved from trying to explain Michael's arc from the hospital to becoming himself again. He killed the mechanic to get his suit back and then he stopped into a convenience store to get one of the commercial masks that was put out by the town. For some reason in Little's Halloween universe, the town wanted to commemorate its history by putting out a Michael Mask? Because it was a store-bought mask, it didn't have the same maybe texture and detail that a movie mask would have. So now they start looking at the dailies and go, why is that mask not look quite right? And the reason is because the mask was borrowed from a drugstore. Then they said, well, maybe we need this to look a bit more like the mask that people are expecting. And somewhere in all that conversation, I think the through line of the mask got a little bit lost. I spoke of Don Post previously. He also did the Halloween 3 masks. He was brought back to work with Ken Horn for Michael's mask on part four. According to Ken, the first mask that was brought back to him was pink with white hair. There was some miscommunication where he gave him the corrections, but then didn't get to see the mask before it showed up to set. And when it showed up, they were pink with white hair. Ken had to repaint over them, which is why they kind of have that bumpy texture. There's an infamous mistake in this movie during one of the school scenes where we we do see that mistake mask. A commonly asked question from fans that just haven't done the digging is why? I still believe that the reason that mask in the throwing uh, Loomis through the door in the elementary school is off is because someone ran to the prop truck at four in the morning and brought in the wrong mask and everybody was too overtired to catch it. I really think that was it. Some fans have theories about that moment, as they always do, but Little confirms this once again in the director's commentary. He says they simply were not able to get back to that school to do reshoots. It was just a mistake. Sorry, conspiracy theorists, no more fun to be had on that one, but there is a lot of fun to be had with the onset stories. So let's get into that and we can break down some of the filmmakers intentions along the way. Starting with the very opening credits of this movie, they're notably different from the first three installments which all were variations of the pumpkin theme. The idea here was to make the aesthetic revolve around the season rather than the holiday. Fall harvest, welcome of winter, trying to give it a more Midwestern feel, even though it was shot in Salt Lake City, Utah. They were able to pull off those kind of artistic choices because there was not much studio involvement, besides Akkad being really picky about his Michael. But other than that, he didn't really impose himself. Besides that, it seems like there was a lot of mutual trust. One of the differences early on was the original connection to Halloween 2. The opening scene was a shot down on the hospital corridor looking at a wall and it was sort of a beat and a beat and then the, the explosion, the wall would just would burst open from that blast and you would see Dr. Loomis's body flying backwards, you know, kind of in, you know, a flame and you know, almost right directly at the camera and then you would cut so you would know he was blasted out of that room and survived. We decided only to reference the first movie. And I think the reason was that we didn't want to get tied up with a lot of logic police questions about Michael and exactly what happened to Dr. Loomis. McElroy still thinks that they should have gone back to Halloween 2, but I think I disagree with that because it is very heavily implied with the makeup on Loomis and everything. Throughout shooting, it all went pretty smoothly. I actually don't have a dedicated horror stories section the way I do for parts five and six. Oh yeah, stick around. But there were some difficulties as there always are, including with the bridge crash scene. They had to get a huge crane to lower the ambulance into the river and it was hard getting the rights to do that. Pleasance was also not fond of getting in the river so they used multiple cameras so he wouldn't have to change clothes too many times. Speaking of Pleasance, Dwight Little's views on Loomis and Michael's relationship are, are kind of weird. His intention was to play Michael very literally as an escaped mental patient, not really as a paranormal entity until the end. And in the director's commentary, he said that Michael understands that he wouldn't be 
Michael without Dr. Loomis, which is why he lets him live. So interesting unpacking some of the filmmaker intentions because a lot of the times it's just something I would never consider. Oh, I do have a diet horror story actually that has to do with Loomis's makeup. They had to reshoot all the scenes with Donald's scar at one point because someone told them it looked like a fried egg on his face. Another diet horror story also involves Pleasance from a very cold and exhausting night. Uh, we were shooting this sequence all night long. He spent the whole movie without a hat, but it was so cold that that night we shot about 12 takes with various cameras. Now we had script supervision, costume, wardrobe, camera departments, myself, all these people watching him. And he had done half the night's work in his wardrobe hat that he was just wearing to keep warm. And in fact, his character didn't wear a hat in the entire movie. You know, we had to go back and reshoot all that to take the hat off. According to the cast and crew, he also hung out by himself a lot. He stayed in a different hotel. He was very quiet and mild-mannered. And also that he drank a lot of bourbon. But for the most part, everyone just says, wow, thespian, consummate professional. Everyone seems really touched by even the most brief encounters with him. That's what everyone wants to know is what was he like? I think it's because Pleasance did so little press for these movies and he's passed away so long ago now that he's almost become this mythic being, kind of like Michael Myers himself. Another commonly asked question is, was the cops do it by the book shirt designed for the movie? And the answer is yes. Since I don't have horror stories, I do have just a couple other fun facts. This one is a little bit intense. When Danielle was having to cry about her mom, Laurie Strode, she couldn't quite get there emotionally. So she got a stern talking to from the director who then shut her in the closet and turned off the light and then she started sobbing hysterically. Another great actor in this movie is Sasha Jensen. He has one of the best death scenes in this movie and this was meant to be a tribute to the old western style fight. They pulled this off by putting a teeter-totter under his butt so he could be lifted up but while they were rolling on that he started to gag on his fake blood. He thought that that would be cut but they ended up using that take. The one kind of true horror story is from the climax. At least this sounds horrifying to me. Originally in the script it was supposed to take place in the basement. There's a big fight there the furnace gets knocked over, it lights the house on fire, and then that is what drives the girls up to the roof. So the climax we see in the movie also was supposed to be engulfed in flames. They scrapped the fire, but to pull the rest of it off, they built this fake roof, fake house out in a field with a roof that was about 16 feet off the ground. They did this because they needed to be able to get the low angles and everything and shoot upwards at it, but that's still so tall. That sounds so dangerous, and they had no harnesses. The girls said, I think in the commentary, that there were some mattresses scattered around on the ground in case they fell, but it was freezing cold at night when they're shooting and there was a dew that would collect on the roof. Of course, that would freeze over and so Ellie Cornell kept actually slipping on it. They made the roof so fast that at the bottom of it, this, a little staple gun was sticking out, the staple. And when they slid her down the roof, that's when it caught her stomach and it cut it right open all the way down. You know, I didn't bleed out, there were no intestines showing, I mean it was not that, you know, it was just a surface wound, but I think the set medic went bonkers just because we had more to shoot. So they patched me up and we went back to work. Ellie and Danielle are true final girls on and off the screen, but Danielle wouldn't have been if she had been kidnapped off the set. No, I'm just kidding, there's that one scene where Jamie is running around the residential neighborhood and she's knocking on the doors and she's screaming. So they did that in a real neighborhood and production sent out letters letting them know, hey, this is the time we're gonna be doing this, don't worry worry, we are shooting a movie. But one family wasn't home when those notices went out and so they called the cops on production at 4 a.m. So that's when the crazy rumor started that Danielle Harris was almost kidnapped off of the Halloween 4 set. But she and Ellie Cornell attribute this as their most fun movie to work on to date. Even though they'd roll into their hotel at 8 or 9 in the morning and they'd be covered in fake blood and mud, they felt very taken care of by the production. Let's wrap up this section by discussing the ending of the movie because it does inform quite a lot of what went down with Halloween 4. Five. McElroy wanted to tie this movie into the first movie's opening scene to signal that it's starting all over again with Jamie. The evil has now transferred to her. Little seconds that it was not genetic, that prior to that moment, it had just been Jamie until she was touched by Michael. We'll talk about the undoing of that with Halloween 5, but I speculate that that iconic ending is what really stuck with audiences. And I saw a huge line of people down the sidewalk, which I assumed was for the Jodie Foster movie or was whatever the big hollow studio movie was. As we were driving around the corner, we started to realize that the line that we were seeing was for our movie. And I remember sitting in the audience and just listening to the, the gasps and the, and the, you know, the reactions. There's nothing like that, you know, for a writer is to hear 
and see the audience reacting to your words. With a budget of $5 million, it went on to gross $17.7 million worldwide. Even though Halloween 3 had a better budget to box office ratio, Halloween 4 was seen as a bigger success because of the fan reaction. But critically, it was all over the map. From Karen James in 1988, Halloween 4 The Return of Michael Myers opened yesterday on two screens at the Criterion Center and at seven other theaters in Manhattan. It seems the latest stage in some curious evolutionary pattern. The slasher species keeps proliferating and getting weaker at the same time. These days, the murderer in the white mask is more reminiscent of Broadway's Phantom of the Opera than a serial movie killer. Before long, Halloween 4 turns into a series of special effects, including an exploding gas station and an electrocution. Does Michael Myers need all this high-tech help? Isn't it enough just to be a homicidal maniac? The legacy with the fans, cast, and crew tells a different story. McElroy describes this being his best screenwriting experience, bar none. That what he wrote on the page is actually what made it into the movie. The actors have become prolific figures in the horror zeitgeist, even if they didn't do so right away. Once Halloween 4 came and went, you know, it got, it got really, really good response. I think as it got farther and farther away from its original appeal of 1 and 2, it wasn't until after Rachel was killed that people were like, oh, no! Daniel Harris credits the fans for the career that she has now. At the 30th anniversary screening in 2018, Howarth said that it's really difficult to sit down and watch a movie that you were involved in right away, but it was his first time seeing the movie in 15 years and he felt that it really held up. Everyone still holds a lot of pride for their involvement in the movie. The fans love the movie so much, but could that possibly be credited for the ensuing mess? Yes, my dear maggots, it's time to speak about one of the least loved movies of the Halloween franchise, Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. Of course, because of the positive reception on Halloween 4, Halloween 5 was immediately on the table. Dwight and Alan were approached to continue the franchise, but both of them had teamed up for an action film, and so they passed on this. But like I said, could the success of part 4 be the start of the downfall of part 5? I felt, honestly, that we had somehow, through hard work and a little bit of luck and time, we had almost made a kind of perfect Halloween movie. One of the things people do, even people who are mixed on the film, they certainly always credit the ending as being a nearly perfect ending. I felt like I had done it to the best of my ability and I didn't know whether I wanted to go and try again because I thought, you know, I don't know if I can hit this ball that well a second time. That's honestly totally valid, but what they had set up was not guaranteed to be continued without them. I think they rightfully assumed that whoever would pick up the torch would do their best to continue the amazing storyline that they set up for them. But according to Mustafa, the failures of Halloween 5 can be attributed to not getting enough of that team back together. They were rushing on production trying to capture lightning in a bottle. They were back on set a year to the day from Halloween 4, so Danielle Harris actually celebrated her 11th and 12th birthdays on set. But I think they did still bring some value players to the table. They had a DP named Robert Draper, who was fantastic, but he's from the UK and he was going to pass on the project because his wife was nine months pregnant with their second child. So they struck a deal with him to bring him and his wife out to Salt Lake City and his son was born there. And that is why his middle name is Michael. Despite not being involved, Deborah Hill also recommended the director Dominique Othenin Girard, who was a Frenchman. He was a very eclectic and artsy person who apparently conducted himself in interesting ways. When I was in front of him, and and he's associated. I made a question to, to Mustafa. Would you like to do Halloween 6 one day? Me really angry and said, Dominique, are you joking? Who are you talking to? Mm. And I said, because really, would you allow me this? And I took the script and I put it into the trash can in front of him <laughs> and in front of his collaborators. Mm. And they were all shocked. And I said, because you're mixing genres, you're doing body count, you're doing uh, dream uh, killing, and this is not belonging to the essence of Halloween. From that point on, there were three writers and a producer supervising the script. So just right off the bat, a lot of cooks in the kitchen and things would constantly be changing from script to screen on set. But before we can get there, we have to talk about casting, of course. We have to discuss the man Don Shanks. Don Shanks is a huge flirt. <laughs> Don had connections with other stuntmen in the industry that got him connected to this production. He thought he was coming in just to help out with stunts on this movie, but he got an audience with the director and Dominic told him to walk like wood through water. So he did that and he was hired pretty much immediately. George P. Wilbur was disappointed about not returning as was Daniel Harris because actually the two of them got close on Halloween 4. But Danielle quickly became attached to Don Shanks. She said that he would always give her neck massages, that he would swing her around and he was almost never wearing his mask to, you know, be more friendly. Something interesting that was illuminated from his interviews was that he was told not to inspect the past Michael performance 
performance is. They wanted him to bring his own energy to it, I guess because the franchise was starting to veer in a different direction at this point because of the psychic connection to Jamie. And, uh, you know, and there are some points in this movie where it kind of feels like they're trying to humanize him, but I'm not sure. There was also a bit of a diversion in the mask, wasn't there? The mask remains a hot topic from Halloween 4 to Halloween 5 because in this movie, it was just kind of differently bad. According to Don Shanks, at legend Greg Nicotero had designed the mask on his own face, but it didn't fit on Don. So they had to go in and redo the moldings. And I speculate that in some scenes, they were still using the original mask from Nicotero because it is so wide at the neck that I swear I remember hearing a story about them having to cut up the back of the mask, but that didn't come up in my research. So I don't know if that was just something someone made up in my comment section. Let me know. They also had to put nylon stocking covers over the eyes, which became a problem later on. But on the 25 Years of Terror DVD, they did an interview with Nicotero. He says his partner, Bob Kirkman, sculpted the mask based on photos from Cine Fantastique for Halloween 5. There weren't tons of photos available back then for reference the way that we have the internet now. So it was really hard to make accurate recreations. He also says that different directors always want to put their own unique stamp on the mask, I guess to make it unique to their film. But I just have a lot of questions concerning all of that because why? You know, what about continuity? Uh, like most people care about that. I don't think we'll ever really know for sure. So I just say we move on. There's a lot of mess to cover with Halloween 5. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go over the general onset experiences, talk about the director's intent. Then I have a very large horror story section followed by a section I've entitled The Problems. And within that section is a subsection dedicated to the man in black. And after all of that, I'm really not sure if you're going to have all the answers you seek to Halloween 5, but I'm going to try my best. To set the stage with some positivity, all the actors really seem to love Dominique and he loved Danielle Harris. In the commentary, he goes off for several minutes just about how much he loved working with her. It was like a little bird who was <laughs> high up on this tree in its nest, who'd never flew out of the nest. Right. And I'd say, I'm down there, 30 feet down there, and say, come on, jump. Mm -hmm. Jump, girl. You can do it. I and you would, you would be, throw yourself down the tree and <laughs> hoping that your wings would open to, to you know, carry your weight. Mm. And you'd take off flying. Mm. He says she was authentically offering herself in the character, not trying to preserve herself at all. And she agrees it was the performance of her life. She, to this day, I guess, is still looking for scripts to do that kind of work. He also wasn't the only one that absolutely loved her. Wendy Kaplan became like an older sister to Danielle who looked up to her and wanted to be just like her. But self-described, Daniel Harris was also like a 40-year-old living in a little 12-year-old's body. So they also kind of just became friends. She gives me all the things that I need as an actress because she's so just a very beautiful person. It really helps that I like her, you know, in my real life because I can love her in the movie more. Can't help myself from spotlighting Danielle. Let's get into the movie. Starting from the very opening, this movie had a way cooler kill to kick things off. They had this punk rock comedian playing a character named Dr. Death who had a pet parakeet who finds Michael and actually puts the thorn tattoo on him. Also in his home, he has all these druid drawings of runes and stuff. And he does an incantation over Michael which brings him back to life. This was supposed to lay the groundwork for the Cult of Thorn, but Mustafa hated this opening and so they had to reshoot it. In the original opening, he broke his back and slammed a rock through his chest. Don Shanks thought it was one of his best kills. Speaking of, Mustafa's daughter would come out and sit on Don's lap and Akkad would say, he's Michael, you're supposed to be scared of him. Since Shanks was playing Michael though, he always tried to kind of go the extra mile to be nice with everyone. Everyone also initially thought that he wasn't tall enough to play the role, so he put lifts in his boots. But when Mustafa came on Set, he was like, no, no, he's too tall. And so they took them out. Then of course, we're introduced to where Jamie is at in the hospital now. Danielle has explained this shift from the end of Halloween 4 as them still needing Danielle to remain a sympathetic character. That it probably just wouldn't have worked out to have her running around killing people for the audience at least. Maybe audiences in the 80s weren't ready for that yet. I still think it would have been awesome. What was not awesome was Rachel's death. I think that as fans, we still have a right to be kind of upset about that because even Ellie Cornell herself is. I had a suspicion that I wouldn't make it through this one. I didn't quite expect to be killed off so early. And it was the way it was written was that I was supposed to get scissors shoved down my throat. I just thought for Rachel, it was too undignified. You know, I made a fuss about that and they rewrote it. So it was a little bit less um, 
graphic. To Ellie, her death didn't make sense at all, given all that she lived through in part four, and Danielle remembers being sad on set the day of her death. I have a new perspective on it from director Dominique, who said that she represented the all-American innocent girl. It's so unfair to make her disappear, which was exactly why he did it. He wanted the audience to be on edge from early on, so that the audience would know that from that point, any horror was possible. And fine. It, that's rational. Fine. On a lighter note, of course, Donald Pleasance returned once again, so I'm gonna spotlight him once more. He almost didn't make it in this movie because his work visa expired. The head of the Utah Film Commission had to personally step in to help them out, just so he could be on set for one week. He was still on his bourbon kick this time around. Danielle actually remembers smelling it on his breath when they would have kind of up-close scenes together. Nonetheless, it's said that he treated the script like Shakespeare and that he wanted to do all of his own stunts. So when you see Loomis slammed against the window, that's good old Donald, and he basically did everything except for going over the railing. When he's laying over Don Shanks, he famously said to him, oh, now I get it, I abused you as a child. I didn't really get that. I never came to the same revelation there because Michael has always been evil on two feet, right? But okay. Throughout his time on set, Danielle thought that it was so cool that he had a big bed in his trailer. When he rapped, he actually demanded that production keep his trailer on set for Danielle because he said that she was the star of the movie, which is so valid. Like, I was kind of horrified to learn that, but it makes sense that they wouldn't do that for her because she was a child, so they could kind of skirt around those nice amenities for her. One of the most surprising things I learned about her, though, on this set is that she partied with the best of them. When I heard this next part, I was like, where were your parents? Like, was everything okay? It was a, a party, uh happening uh, nightly in our room. I mean, we were out in the hallway of the hotel, you know, at like eight o'clock in the morning, running around, like music, and we probably trashed a couple hotel rooms. It was like our version of like a frat party. Two o'clock in the morning, we're shooting tomorrow. And there was this little little bar, um, this like big cabinet where they kept all the little liquor bottles. It had like a latch on it, but it would open just a teeny bit, and I was the only one that had a small enough arm to reach in and grab the bottles for everybody. And we would uh, party in my room, so I was I was one of the gang. <laughs> it sounds like college to me. They were partying, people were hooking up with each other, Wendy and Greg Nicotero, I guess they had a little fling. Oh, and speaking of him, sometimes Danielle would go back with Nicotero to the hotel, and she would be covered in all of her bruise makeup and the mud and everything, and one day he pretended that he was her dad and that he'd beaten her. So, yeah. Anyway, quickly shifting gears, do you remember the buddy cops that randomly change the tone of this movie anytime that they pop up. Even those actors themselves did not understand their role in the movie, but all the actors kind of chalk this stuff up to Dominique being a very eccentric and very French director. Alan Howarth decided to lean into it, which is why there are kind of those goofy clown sound effects when they're on screen, and honestly, it works for me. I think it's funny. Every time me and Dave, my partner, walked away from camera, he would always say, when you walk away from camera, I want you to walk like penguins. Penguins, you get me? Hilarious and probably indicative of the way that Europeans view American cops. Honestly, 10 out of 10, no notes on the direction there. Now, not to reframe all those mostly positive aspects of making this film, but it, it is kind of time to do that. Let's get into the horror stories. There's the behind the scenes story that maybe if we, if we put our tin foil hats on, could maybe explain Dominique's perspective on American cops. He describes being out, I think, with some of the producers when a cop pulled them over. They had a bunch of beer bottles in the car, which he said that some of them they had peed into, which he was trying to stifle his giggles when the cops were like sniffing the bottles. He ends up pulling the cop aside and he's like, listen, I'm sober. We're with the Halloween production and we are bringing $5 million to your city. And the cop let them go, just instructing them to go home right away. Crazy stuff, but the onset stories are even nuttier. Let's start with the opening of the film once again. And now I kind of feel bad for in the past making fun of this opening with Michael bobbing goofily down the river in kind of a very undignified way. Well, it turns out the water was freezing cold, like 34 degrees. Don Shanks had to keep his feet up or else he'd get sucked under the water. He only had a wetsuit on, no flotation device at all, and if he didn't catch the net that was cast out for him, he would have gone through a water processing plant. Water would also get up under his mask and he couldn't blow it out or breathe because the eye holes were covered with nylon, like I said, and they would fill up with water. Don Shanks went through it. I have yet to research any worse horror stories on the Halloween sets because another one 
of the most horrifying stories is how they accomplished the car crash scene. For one thing, Danielle was doing her own stunt here. She's actually being chased by the car in the woods and because of all the smoke they were pumping in, Dawn was having a hard time seeing her and there were some close calls. Not to mention that she had food poisoning and was throwing up between takes. She wasn't the only one that was almost hit. Wendy Kaplan also tripped over her cape at one point and Dawn ended up breaking just in time over her body. She was fine though, it's all good. But when the car actually crashed, I don't know how Shanks did not lose his life. So what we did was we went and we had a mirror made up. The mirror is like, you know, the size of that wall back there. And when they brought it up, it was supposed to be tempered glass. Tempered glass, when you hit it, it just sort of shatters. What they did was they brought real glass. And when that comes out, it comes out in shards. And so uh, if you watch the movie, I'm sitting on the right hand side because it's a mirror image. But when they went, went through it, I had to duck and go underneath the, the dash because they originally thought that they had killed me because it took the whole top off. When the car exploded, it's kind of like the story that I shared in Halloween 3, where nobody jumped to action, nobody jumped to their emergency spot. Everyone was kind of just standing there dumbly in awe to the point where Dom forgot to yell cut. And I think it was one of the producers that was like, yo, are you gonna call cut? Luckily, he was totally fine. And he actually got a worse injury while fighting with Donald Pleasance. During the fight with Michael and Loomis, they dropped a real chain on Shanks, which obviously, ouch, that's heavy. Pleasance also had a double-sided pipe to hit him with. Only one side was soft and stunt ready, but after going for so long, he was tired and accidentally hit Shanks with the wrong side and broke his nose. I forgot to mention earlier too, that that scene was meant to be Pleasance's franchise rap. That was supposed to be his death scene there, but there were other injuries on set too. Tamara Glynn actually insisted that her character fight back against Michael, which I'm so glad she did. Actresses, I think you should always advocate for your characters doing badass stuff because the worst thing that they can do is say no. Anyway, when she shoved against the wall, a rusty nail cut her arm and she had to go get a tetanus shot. In the same scene, actor Matthew Walker had to lay down on an ironing board for over four hours on top of a fake chest for his death shot. Unfortunately, the foam was too thick, so they tried twice and couldn't get any blood to spurt out. Not a horror story, just sounds really uncomfortable. This next one is definitely a horror story though. I don't understand how they seemingly skirted so many labor laws, like if it was because they were in Utah, but it's time to talk about that iconic laundry chute scene. They actually were stabbing through the laundry chute with a real knife and I was in there with my feet up and it was marked so I knew when to not put my feet down. There was no harness. I wasn't being held up by anybody or anything and I was climbed all the way down there and just propped myself up in there. She goes on to talk about how there is a lot from Halloween 5 that she would never do again, the car chase scene and the laundry shoot scene included. In the shoot scene, there actually was a shot that was considered too graphic and had to be taken out. Michael did end up slicing Jamie at one point. So she has a big cut on her leg in the next shot where she crawls out of the shoot. And again, I just say, where were her parents? Like why, who let her do this stuff? Or maybe that's just how things were back then? Probably, I don't know. Now those horror stories seem worth it because those are all some of the best scenes in the movie. In terms of everything else though, it was a messy production. So I kind of just want to talk generally about a lot of the problems on set. One minor thing I've already mentioned was the eccentricity of Dominique. This caused some actors to have a real disconnect with his direction. Everything he would say to me was, it's about sex, sexy. And I was like, okay, I'm walking my dog. You know, he was all like, sexy. Rachel wasn't big in the sexy department. Very similar to the cop actors. Another thing was what was on the script was not necessarily what they would be shooting that day. Up until the first day of shooting, the character of Billy was supposed to be really big into BMX. And there was even a whole scene of him saving Jamie's life via bicycle. The day they were supposed to shoot that was the day they nixed it. Things would also switch up super last minute with wardrobe. Tina and Samantha had to switch costumes really last minute because they suddenly decided that the girl who had as sex should be dressed as the devil. Ellie Cornell says that whenever there are a lot of changes midstream, it's never a good sign. So she kind of is already having bad feelings on set. It's especially bad when you consider the money wasting element, which I am just kind of speculating that's what caused Mustafa and Dominique to butt heads towards the end. Apparently there's a whole massacre scene where Michael kills a bunch of members of a SWAT team that didn't make it to the film. And I'm like, why? Not only does it sound really expensive, but it also sounds awesome. In my opinion though, the worst mistake is actually 
what they added. So yes, kids, it is time to talk about the man in black. There is so much hearsay in this section. I actually feel like I don't have a single solid fact to share with you. I don't even trust the origin of where they came up with this character because it just doesn't sound real. The man in black was never in the script. The man in black uh, showed up midway. Apparently there was a man in Salt Lake who would show up to set often. I guess they were not completely private sets. So the residents of the city would come to watch and he was a stranger. He was just some guy, but he would always show up dressed in slickers and a hat. And apparently that is what inspired the character of the man in black. Not only did he show up midway through filming, but Don Shanks was shoved into the costume for like half the time. They would even draw the thorn tattoo on both wrists so that he could change character mid scene. When he asked a producer, hey, what are they doing with this? He was told, don't worry about it. They're gonna figure it out in part six. Robert Draper has said the man in black was a mystery to both him and Dominique, but in Don Shanks audio commentary, he said that they did explain the character to him, that he and Michael were basically the same character, just different representations of it. Allegedly, he was told that by Dominique. So I'm like, is this a language barrier issue? Why is there such conflicting information from everyone? I could definitely see maybe Dominique just trying to come up with an answer on the spot for his actor, because if us actors, we need to be able to rationalize what we're doing to like, you know, draw emotion to be able to perform. So I do kind of believe that all these things could be true. I do kind of also think that nobody wants to take the heat for this unanimously hated character because it is such a universally contentious element of that movie. And clearly the communication was bubkiss. So no matter what information comes out, I feel like it's just gonna remain a he said, she said situation. A situation even. I welcome you to peruse my research materials. They're always readily available. But honestly, I would advise that you just spare yourself the trouble. It's kind of just one of those things. And one of those things that likely contributed to the poor reception of this film. On a budget of $6 million, it only grossed 11.6 million worldwide. It currently sits at a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes with critics saying things like a prime example of diminishing returns. This was the beginning of the end of the Halloween franchise. Oh, hey, Chris Stuckman. He liked the reel that I made about the Halloween timeline a few weeks ago. But some of the most outspoken people against this movie are the filmmakers of Halloween 4. When I saw Halloween 5, I was very disappointed they didn't go in the direction that I'd hoped they would with the legacy and with Jamie and building on that. There was so much potential in the series to go in a very strong and new direction. It was never intended to have her take over the franchise in that way. Looking back, I really wish we had stayed with it because it would have been nice to follow that line the way I'd originally envisioned. Danielle Harris is also on record saying that she liked Halloween 4 better than Halloween 5. She speculates that if they'd maintained continuity better, Jamie might have ended up in an asylum. She said that if they ever went back and properly did part five, that she would still want to come back as the killer. I'm so down and I think that as a huge fan of the franchise, that's what I would most like to see. Apart from also maybe some kind of continuation of Halloween 3. At the end of the video, I have a little section dedicated to the current legacy of these films. So we'll continue to unpack this later. But for now, if you've made it this far, congratulations. It's time to start talking about Halloween 6. No, well, I, I had to be in it because my character and uh, I've been in all of them except Halloween 3. So naturally they asked me to do it and I did it and I'm doing it. And it's going to be a very good film. I think it's probably probably one of the best. Maybe you noticed they took a pretty long break between Halloween 5 and 6. They needed to get their bearings because Halloween 5 was not very successful. Also, I just took a little break. I ate a burrito and I got myself a glass of wine. Ugh. <sighs> At this time, Mustafa had let the rights lapse back. And so there was kind of a bidding war with Carpenter, who was with New Line and the Weinsteins at Miramax. Most unfortunately, they did go with the Weinsteins. And this was even before their success with Scream. If you know anything about the Weinsteins, I mean, surely you know why Harvey Weinstein is rotting in jail, but they were horrible to work for. If you haven't seen my Scream for Dummies series, learn about it. Just a mess. So even before pre-production could begin, there were problems. Nobody liked the pitches or the scripts that they were receiving, but they were just barreling ahead anyways. So they found their writer, Daniel Farrens, out of desperation because his methods of getting in contact were anything but professional. To be clear, I do not fault him for not being professional because if you're not a Nepo baby, nobody's gonna open those doors. You gotta kick them down. He went so above and beyond for his pitch too because he just was like this 20 year old kid having to prove himself. To his benefit though, he was a huge fan of the franchise. He remembers being 12 years old, sitting on the floor of his living room, watching the original film. He created a Strode family 
tree. He did extensive research on Celtic runes. He also highlighted and annotated the novelization of the original film. It was all in this massive black binder that he presented to Mustafa Akkad. His big log line to wrap it all up was that this was Halloween meets Rosemary's Baby, and Akkad really liked that, so just based on that, he said, okay, go write a treatment. When Ferenc came back with that treatment, Akkad said, I love this, but it's a little too much. We have enough here for Halloween 6 and 7. Farron speculates that he got the job over other professionals because Mustafa really liked his passion. There's an urban legend that Quentin Tarantino wrote the first draft of this movie, and Farron says that's completely untrue. What drove writing the script, however, was figuring out just who the hell this man in black was. He confirms that nobody knew where he came from while they were making part five, and his whole job basically was answering that question. So he took it back to the mythology of the original movie and long-standing questions that the fans had. The fact that he could drive in the original and people always asked, did someone teach him? That little bit of inspo was the kickstarter for his whole script. I imagine it started with the question, who taught him? And then, you know, he came up with the Dr. Wynn character at Smith's Grove and yada yada. Another point of his script was to pass the torch on from Loomis to Tommy Doyle. Not that it was like a conscious thought to write out Dr. Loomis. That just kind of seemed to be the new energy of the franchise. That being said though, in his commentary of the producer's cut, he said that he did not feel equipped to write for Donald Pleasance. The character of Dr. Loomis was also originally written for Christopher Lee, so as a nod to that, he wrote the Dr. Wynn character with Lee in mind. Unfortunately, it seems to this day he disagrees with the casting choice they went with. The other casting choices were great in my opinion. They cast people who actually understood and respected the character of Michael. One of them being newcomer on the scene, Paul Rudd. Michael Myers is... I always did. I always found him to be much more frightening than the other ones, you know, like Jason or anything, because I just thought that the plain white face, that mask, is just, there's something really creepy about it. I think when we do a scene and he would just walk, and even though I knew who the guy was that was playing him and everything else, there is something weird about that. I love Paul Rudd in this movie, and I've said it before, I will say it again. What is that accent? I was only eight years old when I saw him. But I was one of the lucky ones. With the pros, there are always cons, and with casting, the biggest oopsie they made is not bringing back Danielle Harris. Like I said, got a whole segment here that I've entitled Ditching Danielle. After making Halloween 5, she had moved out to LA, assuming that production on Halloween 6 would get rolling rather quickly, which didn't happen to the point where she had kind of just stopped hoping for it. It had been several years, and when she was 17, a breakdown came out from the studio about the character of Jamie Lloyd. Breakdowns are sent to age and they basically just kind of like detail the characters that studios are looking to cast. And in the breakdown for Jamie, it said that they were looking for a lookalike to Danielle Harris, but they wanted someone that was over 18. They wanted to avoid working around a child and those labor laws. So Danielle Harris actually went as far as to get emancipated legally to be in the movie. After that, she was cast, but then came a huge payment dispute. The studio had offered Danielle a thousand dollars flat rate for a week of work when what she paid to get a Emancipated was in the ballpark of three to four thousand dollars. I tried to make it happen and then we got had one more phone call and I'll never forget the woman on the other line said to me, your character is a scale character. You die in the first act. We're not giving you any more money. And I went, I guess I mean nothing to you then. Okay. The silver lining is that Danielle thinks if she had gone through with it and she had been killed off in Halloween 6 that maybe she wouldn't have been able to come back for Rob Zombie's Halloweens. Anyway, we don't get Danielle Harris in part 6. Instead, JC Brandy is cast. Even though the two of them are friends in real life, JC took some heat for being in this movie. But during casting, she didn't realize the role was a recast, I think until her second call. And during that second visit with the casting director, he actually stuck his head out of his office and told his assistant, let everyone else go home, like she's our Jamie. She also had no idea what she was stepping into because the part was so small in the script. Another interesting casting story comes from Mariah O'Brien, who originally read for the lead role, but then they asked her to come back to read for Beth. She was pretty much immediately offered the role, but that she would have to be topless. I was getting like, a line like straight down from Harvey Weinstein, like, we really want you in the movie. And I'm like, I really don't. I'm like, oh, David Lynch wants me to be topless? Sure. Uh, Halloween 6? I don't know. Harvey Weinstein pressuring an actress into nudity? What? No. Never. She was very close to passing on the movie entirely, but then she agreed to do that scene on her own terms. Love to see stories of actresses advocating for themselves in Halloween 5 and 6. And like I said, the movie was helmed by director Joe Chappelle, who Mariah really admired 
scared. She described him as very slow and actor sensitive. And because he was a guy that was willing to take on so much, responding to two separate studio heads, his producers, Daniel Farren's kind of having a say in the script, that made her more comfortable with him and feel more invested in the part. Seems like a lot of the people on the shoot were really great to work with. O'Brien also speaks highly of Marion Hagen and Paul Rudd. She says Paul Rudd treated the script like Shakespeare. A lot of comparisons to good old Billy today. Luckily, shooting the movie the first time around was relatively smooth, but they had to deal with a massive snowstorm. Mariah remembers showing up to Utah and a huge storm hitting that night. Then the next day when she started, the production was using hoses to spray down all the snow in their shooting vicinity. And because it was so cold, the one horror story I did find involves JC Brandy. While she's running around in her hospital gown, she did have several layers on underneath, but because they had a rain machine going on her, the outfit got soaked through. She remembers a scene where she was running and then blacked out. When she woke up in her trailer, the first AD was there and she was like, hey, I can't feel my legs. And he was like, mm, yeah, you have hypothermia. But that doesn't even seem like a negative memory for her. It seems like she really looks upon the whole experience with a lot of fondness. Her only letdown when she's interviewed is that she didn't get to work with the other actors. Seems like the energy was pretty good on set. Maybe Chappelle was dealing with the brunt of the studio arguments and whatnot. Daniel Farron shot a ton of on-set footage. So there are clips of George P. Wilbur messing around. And honestly, these clips are more spooky than any frame of the movie. This was before the Blair Witch Project. They were ahead of their time. There's a ton of behind the scenes of all the practical effects. So I do recommend checking out those little on-set vlogs. Overall, the vibes seem really good. However, Malika Cod recalls Joe Chappelle having too many people to answer to and that the script was not solidly approved before they started filming. When they finished what's now known as the producer's cut, they hosted screenings and those went very poorly. Ugh, I don't really like holding this. Okay, Akkad was fighting for the producer's cut, but the Weinsteins were very involved in this production. Before them, there was a lot more autonomy in the filmmaking because the first five Halloween films were basically independent. Because of the poor test screenings, they were demanding more gore, more kills, and less Loomis. Ultimately, the Weinsteins threatened a legal injunction on the release of the producer's cut, so Joe Chappelle agreed to go back and do reshoots with them. Mustafa had already invested so much money in the movie that his lawyers just recommended that you you gotta relent. So the second version of the film after reshoots is what was theatrically released. There was a rumor that somebody stole a copy of the producer's cut out of Akkad's office, and that was how it was initially leaked, but I couldn't find anyone to verify that. For years, the only copy that you could get your hands on would be like copies floating around at conventions, and then super grainy bootleg versions were available on YouTube. Makes me really appreciate the fact that I own it on Blu-ray, but getting to the theatrical cut was an entire mess. I basically have a second and third break down of this movie. First, I want to go over all the script differences from script to producer's cut, and then I want to go over the differences from the producer's cut to the theatrical cut. Kicking off with, I suppose, my last highlight for Donald Pleasance. His health was failing at the time of shooting the producer's cut. In the original script, Farron's had written in this grand introduction for Loomis and Dr. Wynn. They were going to come down and land in a field in a helicopter. It was scrapped probably for budgetary reasons, but also because Pleasance just couldn't do anything that physically demanding. They even wrote off his burn makeup, by saying he had plastic surgery. He was in such poor health that even sitting for a few hours in a makeup chair was out of the question. Though that explanation is only in the producer's cut. For some reason, they cut out that dialogue in the theatrical cut. They wrapped in January of 1995, and on February 2nd, he passed away in his home in France. He was 75, and he'd had a heart valve replacement surgery, and it just led to some complications and ultimately heart failure, which is why this film, both versions, are dedicated to Donald Pleasance. Even though he did complete filming on the producer's cut, there are still so many differences from script to screen there, so let's get into that. And all of this is stuff that's not abnormal, but I feel like it's worth bringing up because this script just sounds better than either version of the movie. From the opening credits, they diverge from the script. Farron's wanted to include flashbacks to the previous installments just to signify that the lore would be tying into them. There was also supposed to be a mayor character that was dressed in all white. He said he was supposed to look like Colonel Sanders. He was meant to be a counterpart, at least visually, to the man in black. Much like Christopher Lee, was meant to be the counterpart to Donald Pleasance, a good doctor and an evil doctor. But the biggest difference involved the overall tone. Wait a minute, like what happened to all of the scary cat and mouse stalking that was in the script? Like they, they didn't shoot it. And so when I thought we were going to go back and fix things and augment them, I thought we were going to go back and add all those moments of tension and little 
that I know that they wanted to basically gut the story. I didn't even necessarily disagree with that. I just wanted to reshoot it so it wasn't so hokey. You know, like it looked like like the Temple of fucking Doom. You know? <laughs> so yeah, again, I'm, in my naivete, I thought that they were going to go back and change the movie back to what he intended it to be originally. It just became something kind of goofy to me, and I just I never understood. He felt that the aesthetic stripped away the relatability. That instead of having a grounded setting, it kind of became this gothic fever dream. He's gone so far as to say that he should have begged a cod to let him direct it, but I don't think that would have saved them from the Weinsteins botching it anyway. He wanted it to feel more Carpenter inspired while they wanted a gory slasher. Barons made his displeasure known, which is why he and Joe Chappelle started to butt heads, but he doesn't blame him for kind of playing the game with the studio. I guess Chappelle had signed on to a three movie deal with Miramax, and so his one for them was Halloween 6. Barons has said that he thinks he kind of sold out on Halloween, and I think that's totally fair to say. Fans also often wonder if there ever was a scene written that Michael and Loomis shared, and there was. When the coven falls apart, originally there was going to be kind of like a chase scene and then a confrontation between the two. And the original ending was supposed to be this big setup to make it look like Tommy Doyle was the one that had committed all those crimes. And I would say maybe the biggest plot difference by a mile, just because it was so jarring, is that there was never any incest in the script. The paternity of the baby was always supposed to be very ambiguous, a la Rosemary's baby, you know, with the visions of her just seeing the cult members' faces around her. With Michael, it just seems like the translation from script to screen was botched all around. I don't think that my intention was that they ever controlled him. I, I always thought that he controlled them. It was almost like in the original movie when you, I think the television version where they say that the staff of Smith's Grove feared him that they did what he wanted. He, they were at his beck and call. Mm -hmm. I always sort of thought that, that they almost worshiped him that he was almost like a kind of a deity to them. That just makes more sense and gives the original film a pretty cool and like satisfying backstory. It would make more sense why Michael was able to orchestrate breaking out of the mental hospital and why he was able to drive. Ferenc has been asked many times about the theatrical cut and where that sort of scientific alternate explanation of the pregnancy came from. He had nothing to do with that. He does not know how they came up with that and I don't think he's a fan. I think mayhaps it is preferable to the incest subplot, but it makes less sense. As soon as they dive into the cult in the third act is where the movie loses Daniel. He was inspired by the third act in the fog, actually. The ghost pirates descending on the characters in the church is kind of what he wanted to happen in the Myers house. He never wanted it to be such a heavy ritualistic aesthetic. Again, it was supposed to be more relatable. It was supposed to kind of give audiences the thought of, well, what are my neighbors doing in the house next to me? Just a lot more understated and stylistically linked to the original film. Things get even messier and further away from Farron's script with the theatrical cut, so let's now get into that. I'm always gonna say this, but watch the dead meat cut comparison for Halloween 6. It's so thorough, it literally gives you a direct side-by-side -side for every single difference. I'm giving you a more general overview because otherwise, like, I'd just be copying their work. So if you want the full breakdown, their video, of course, will be linked in the master resource post. To set the stage a bit, they replaced the DP for reshoots, which I think is one of the more insane things that I learned. I don't think my non-film industry audience can really recognize how insane that is because this was Halloween 6. This is not like a Marvel film where everything is like very formulaic. So you can send off a B unit to shoot a car chase, okay? There, there's not gonna be a lot of artistic liberty there. But when my second short is released next year, you're gonna see how different the camera work is from my first short, Somnum, which you can watch here on YouTube, by the way. Just because I'm the same director, I've got the same producer, I've got even the same lead actress, similar location, whatever. I had different DPs on those projects and they look completely different. You can be using the same equipment and everything, but any person you bring onto a set is gonna inject their own flavor. It's just what happens. Another insane thing that I learned is that they replaced George P. Wilbur under the mask because they wanted a more slim actor to play Michael. I hate the Weinsteins. <laughs> Earlier on in the movie, the main differences are the slower pace. We kind of get to know the family a little bit better. Those scenes are a bit extended and Michael is a bit more stocky. The color grading is different, so the theatrical cut looks a lot more warm and I guess a little more fallish. We get more of Carpenter's original score in the producer's cut where they replace that with generic grunge in the theatrical cut. Everything also becomes more gory. They added a ton of kills. Originally there were eight kills, which got bumped up to seven. 
17 kills in less time too because the producer's cut is 96 minutes while the theatrical cut is only 88 minutes. One of those kills was Jamie and the test audience hated how she died in the hospital so they changed her death scene to getting impaled on the hay baler which audiences also hated. Once you get to Kara being kidnapped the cuts diverge completely except for a couple shots with Donald Pleasance for obvious reasons. They actually went as far as to reshoot one of Pleasance's scenes even though he was no longer alive so they just repurposed his coverage. And of course we've already discussed the kind of alternate explanations at the ending for Jamie's pregnancy with the test tube babies. Let's honestly stop talking about that. Another thing that bothers me is that they removed more of Dr. Wynn and Dr. Loomis's relationship in the theatrical cut. It's so much more developed in the first cut. It makes the Wynn reveal a lot more impactful for me because it feels more like a genuine twist. The last comparison I'll make is a bizarre one and is one of my least favorite things about the producer's cut. In that cut, there is a voice that pops up multiple times that is telling Danny what to do, specifically to kill for her. Stay out of here. for you. Besides that, most of the reshoots feel pretty nonsensical to me. This whole production seemed nonsensical and audiences felt the same way. No. Daniel Harris, C6? No, my mom went to see it in the theaters and people said people were booing. Yeah. Really? Wow. So I'm not gonna go walk in there and, and watch you're, it. You're <laughs> as far as I'm aware, the consensus online on most websites is for the theatrical cut, even though the producer's cut is more readily available now. For a long time it wasn't. A lot of audiences still don't know it exists. But I'm sure that there is a mixture of a fraction of people that unknowingly reviewed the producer's cut and mixed into these websites. So bear all of that in mind here, okay? But on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got an 8%. A bit better, it's got a 36% audience score. I don't want to involve Letterboxd here because there isn't a separate page for the producer's cut at all. They're all lumped in together. But they had a budget of $6 million and they only went on to gross $15 million at the box office. That would be equivalent to about $37 million today, but that's obviously nowhere near what the current Halloween trilogy just did. I think the most damning response comes from the people that were in it. So when we went to a screening, I watched the movie and was like, where is the script? for the movie that I acted in. Like, I didn't understand what they had done to it. Due to critics and audiences alike detesting this movie, thus ends the Thorn timeline. People wanna debate me about this on TikTok, but this is not a difference of opinion, okay? This is this is a difference of reality. Yes, in H2O, Lori says that she faked her death. It does not mean that it connects to the timeline in Halloween 4. She has two entirely different children in those timelines between the Thorn timeline and H2O. John and Jamie are canonically the same same age in their respective timelines. So what, you think that John was a secret twin and that Lori decided to only keep one of her children? Don't even take it from me. Take it from multiple people involved in the franchise. Maybe they didn't want to tie it to the other ones because, you know, H2O sort of pretended like the other ones didn't happen. Yeah, it was a reset. It was a restart. Yeah, it was a departure. And it made sense. I mean, they brought, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis decided she would make the next one her return to the series, which made perfect sense and I think it was the right time for that to happen and mm -hmm. I think in the treatment that Kevin Williamson had written that they he did acknowledge the continuity line of four five and six but ultimately they dropped it because they were like why even cross-pollinate this thing and make it confusing for general audiences let's just call it a wash and move on. I will give you that the early drafts of H2O were supposed to follow Halloween 6, but this was scrapped. Danielle Harris is salty about this. She says it would have been nice to be remembered, but the fact is she wasn't because she didn't exist in the H2O timeline. Lucky for all of us though, she came back to the franchise in a different way and she's still super involved in the fandom. Now I thought it'd be fun to have one final section to wrap a little bow on this deep dive, just discussing where are they now and what's up with the legacy of this timeline now. Starting with Dwight Little from Halloween 4, I found interviews from as recent as last year, but back when the David Gordon Green trilogy was starting to get underway, he was asked if he would ever return to the franchise. He says he's still in touch with Malika Cod, but that they were currently finding their way again with John Carpenter, so he doesn't imagine himself returning to the franchise. He says it's fine because he's happy with the Halloween movie that he made. He also doesn't watch the newer installments because he can't watch them without feeling like, that's not what I would have done. I guess he watched Halloween 2018 because in one of those interviews, he said that he watched it, but that it didn't feel like it had a Halloween feeling to it. He also said in his most recent reunion with some of the cast that he's constantly asked if he'll write a book about the making of Halloween 4, and I think he should. Danielle Harris was also a part of that reunion, and she is now a mom to two young boys, and I feel like she's just living her best mom life. So last night, I showed Carter, who's my older son, Halloween 4 for the first time. Of course, I fast-forwarded through all of the scenes except for mine. <laughs> 
because I didn't want him to like get confused or you know he doesn't need to see any of the other stuff and Carter was like glued to the TV screen. The funny thing is that I did some a photo shoot recently and I used like the Michael Myers co- you know, costume. Yeah. Where I had my husband dress up as Michael. So now oh. when they see Michael on, <laughs> they call him daddy. Adorable, kind of crazy, but adorable. Like I said, throughout the years, just she's super involved with the fandom. In the audio commentary for part four, she told Ellie Cornell that she sold her Halloween four costume to a fan. It was just sitting in a box in her attic. And so she seemed kind of stoked that he would probably be displaying it in like a clear box and preserving it. At that time, she told Ellie that at conventions and stuff, she's constantly telling fans that if they approach her with a good script, she will attach herself to it. I think she meant generally, maybe as a producer, I really would not be surprised to see her in a Halloween fan film at some point. She has a podcast with Scout Taylor Compton, who was her co-star in the Rob Zombie films. It's called Talk Scary to Me. I covered their coverage of Halloween Ends two years ago in my review, if you want to check that out. Halloween 5 lives on as well. They had a panel at the 40 Years of Terror convention, where unfortunately, it seems like there's a good amount of the fandom that still holds on to the resentment of them not carrying on Halloween 4 well enough. I really like to see that those involved in the movie still defend it. Do you agree that like Dominic's directing really hurt the Halloween franchise? And what are your thoughts about him? Dominic's style of filmmaking, um, you know, firstly, he's, he's European. And everything Dominic put into that film, he, he totally did it with all the passion that that oozes because he was a very passionate person personally as well as professionally. I think Dominic did, did a nice job with Five. By all means, I don't think he destroyed the film or, or anything like that. I, I was really happy with it. And, and to this day, you know, people ask me about the, you know, how I feel about it now. And I'm still quite proud of that film. I think the, um, knowing the challenges that I had in that film, just, just looking at it from a cinematography perspective, I'm very proud of that film. If you ever hear how passionately Dominique speaks about working with Danielle, or you see the behind the scenes footage of him directing the young actors, you really can see his passion come through. Like, I do believe that he cared a lot about the movie. Sure, he was eccentric and didn't always mesh with American sensibilities, but there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I can kind of see why he's never really at the Halloween conventions. I mean, for one thing, he's probably in Europe, but also it's really hard to track down any Halloween related interviews with him, and I get it, the fandom probably has not treated him very well. As far as Halloween 6 goes, I want to say a quick rest in peace to Janice Nickram, who played Mrs. Blankenship. She had a really adorable moment with a fan at the 25 Years of Terror convention. Stand up, and I want you guys to give them a hand. They are number one fans, and I met them the first night I was here, get up, and they gave, <laughs> they gave me the courage to sit out at that table and have pictures in front of me because I never thought anybody would want my picture. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Unfortunately, she's passed away about a decade ago, but I totally would have loved to see Mrs. Blankenship come back. Why not? For every fan that holds on to their resentment and anger at the lesser loved movies of the franchise, there are others making amazing connections like that. At the same convention, Marianne gave a fan a big squeeze on stage. So even if on the internet, it seems like there's an overwhelming amount of hate for Halloween 5 and 6, you're not alone. A lot of people love those movies. There's a reason why each and every movie of this franchise has stood the test of time, and why in 2024 I am covering this trilogy that started nearly 40 years ago. It's been an honor and a privilege to call this my job, just getting to dedicate hours and hours of my life researching these films and these people, and I hope that you learned something new today. The biggest of shout outs to my wonderful patrons, without whom this video would not have been possible. I don't have any researchers or editors, it's all me, and they really allow me the time to do this all myself and pursue this as my passion. If you would like to join them over there, you get a bonus video every single week, depending on which tier you join. I did skip out on Halloween week here, but that's because I was working on this Goliath. But it includes podcast episodes with my dad, uh, vlogs when I'm working on set, bonus reviews, all that kind of good stuff. I also have a second channel where I vlog my excursions to spooky places, like all of the original shooting locations of Halloween from 1978. There's a lot of other travel content, and then I would say the bulk of the content over there is me rambling for days and days about physical media. So if you're a fellow collector, there's a very bingeable playlist over there. Finally, I'm all over social media, Instagram, TikTok, follow me wherever your heart desires. More than anything, I hope that you enjoyed this mega deep dive. I hope you have a wonderful Halloween and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!